Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath for those who are at Sabbath now. Don't know if it's Sabbath in uh, where William is or not yet. Uh, still another hour here. But anyway, um, it's nice to see you. And um, we're going to uh, begin our study with a word of prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence into our midst. We just pray that uh, you can help us to see our need of you. We know, Lord, we live in a world of doubt and uncertainty, but we have the surety of your word uh, to guide and direct us in our day-to-day -day lives. Help us to trust in you and the way that you lead. Be with each person who is studying these things, who's watching these videos, who's searching for truth. We pray for a power and conviction in our lives. We pray for one another. And we just ask, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. Be with us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again. So we've been reading. We just got a few more pages of Wagner's confession of faith that he wrote in uh was it may 28th 1916 it's i think that's when he passed away and it was found on his desk it's quite unfortunate obviously you know to have somebody like wagner you know, may 28th 1916 you know fall away from the truth after proclaiming it for so long and to see the type of reasoning that he has now, you know, sometimes we think that our minds work a certain way and we, we reason rationally. But I actually believe with, without the Spirit of God, it's impossible to fully understand truth. And uh, without the Spirit of God, a reasonable mind that was once reasonable through God's Spirit can be completely unreasonable once he rejects that Spirit. And, um, and this is what we see with, with Wagner. Now, I, I don't know if we're going to get this finished today. I'm hoping to. And, and the next thing that we're going to study is uh, A.T. Jones, an appeal for evangelical Christianity, which he presented on May 27th in 1909, which is which is kind of interesting. These Both of these documents are almost on the same date, but seven years apart. So it would be kind of interesting um, to see how that yeah because what does he say here yeah may 27th 1909 so so it's basically uh seven years and one day later and and um, and and of course he was found in may 28th 1916 so you could maybe say it was it was completed the day before may 27th i don't know it doesn't have a date on it on wagner's um uh, confession of faith but but it is interesting. There's the seven years to the, almost to the day there. Okay, so as we were reading here with with Wagner, he's he's taking things very literally, and he has has made an argument that um, certain types of uh, of allegories or comparisons or metaphors. Uh, represent reality and other ones don't. So he says, you know, sin is like a sickness. That, that's real. Uh, but the idea that it's like a debt is not real. So he, he ends up now in this point, he's going to be discussing basically a really literal idea of the sanctuary in heaven. And, and we started reading some of this, but I'm gonna, I think I have to go back. Is it here? Yeah, so back here a little bit. Okay, so we're going to read this. I think we read this paragraph before, but not the one after it. So uh, what possible difference can it make to a man what is done with a record of his sins written in a book when he himself has had them removed from him as far as the east is from the west? A sick man is taken to a hospital and treated. And when he enters, his condition is noted, and every day, that he is there, a careful record is, of his case is made, and every rise of temperature set down together with every unfavorable symptom, and by and by his discharged cured. The record of the course of his disease will remain on file in the hospital as long as the hospital stands. 
The man knows nothing about it. He is freed from the disease, and that is all he cares about. Just as little can the man who is forgiven and cleansed from sin care for or be affected by any record of his former sins. In saying this, I'm not implying that there will be retained forever uh, the record of man's sins. What I do mean is that the blotting out of sins is a vital thing in the sinner himself, and not a mere matter of bookkeeping. So uh, one of the things that that happens when people use an illustration like that, or, or any kind of illustration, an illustration does not prove anything. That is, we need to understand what is in, what the assumptions are uh, that he is addressing here. So first, what record God has of sin, we, we can agree uh, that it is not really of concern to the righteous, right? I mean, the record of my sins and God's salvation step by step in working through my life whether those records are blotted out or not, that whether they're they're still there or not, wouldn't change uh, whether I'm saved or not, right? So one thing we can agree is that the blotting out of sins in this context in the sanctuary is not directly affecting my salvation, right? It, in this sense. But one of the things we, we, I want to look at is a few verses here. Um, that uh, will address this. So I should have set this one up first. I think I can find this. I should have looked for it, but um, just can't think of the words of the verse. Yeah, I need to address this, this idea of the bookkeeping. And I'm just trying to think of, uh, there's there's that verse that talks about, and I don't know why I can't remember the wording of it. It would be easy if I could. Handwriting of ordinances, that's it. I don't know why I couldn't. And, and I've addressed this out, addressed this before. So this is in Colossians. So we're going to go here. So Colossians, we will start uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith and of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Okay, so now we know this verse because it's one of those verses that people will talk about um, that try to say that, you know, the Ten Commandments was nailed to the cross. One thing we can say about this is what is the handwriting of ordinances that was against us? So let's ask that question first. What would that be? The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Anybody comment on that? Uh, some say the handwriting of the law, which was against us. Contemporary English version says God wiped out the charges that were against us for disobeying the law of Moses. One says, having effaced the handwriting of ordinances which stood out against us, blotting out the handwriting of the decree that was against us, uh, having blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, as similar, because we broke God's law, we owed a debt, a debt that listed all the rules we failed to follow. But God forgave us that debt, he took it away and nailed it to the cross. And this one, the English Standard Version, by canceling the 
the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Okay, so that's probably enough. So what is the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, according to these verses? It's definitely not the Ten Commandments that were nailed to the cross. Now, you'll see that some people, and, and you'll see it in this commentary over on the right, Albert Barnes, Barnes commentary, uh, he thinks that this has to do with the ceremonial law, which makes no sense. And we spent a lot of time reading in in uh, Wagner, Wagner's other book that this would obviously not be uh, the ceremonial law or the Ten Commandments. So this would be the record of our sins. So God has forgiven us all of our sins. Has he blotted out the record, the written record of our sins that was against us, that was contrary to us? And did he take it out of the way, nailing it to his cross? That is, it is the handwriting of ordinances or the written record of our sins blotted out? No. Well, according to this verse, it says it is. So how would we understand this verse then? Now, so we could say uh, we were dead in our sins, right? The uncircumcision of our flesh. And God has made us alive in Christ, having forgiven us all of our sins, our, all of our trespasses, blotting out the written record of our sins that was written against us. That was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Now, this is what the verse says. Now, we also have another verse, which we're, we're going to address a bit later, dealing with the blotting out of sins. But here, this is addressing the idea of a debt that is this is the idea that there is a debt that we owe, and that debt has been canceled. That's basically the idea of this verse. Okay. Our sins have been forgiven, our trespasses. The debt that we have that, that, that's written, this written deed of our sins, one of them says, they were blotted out. Now, can we see that this, this is not addressing the Day of Atonement? But in this context here, this is addressing what Christ did on the cross. Did Christ um, forgive us our sins on the cross? We would have to say yes. And in Christ's resurrection, he was raised from the dead. Are we made alive with Christ? Yes, we are. Okay, so we're made alive with Christ. Now, I remember once I was teaching Sabbath school and... Um, I, I think I had I had sung uh, like I don't know maybe it was a song at the beginning of Sabbath school I can't remember but anyway I'd, I'd sung a sung a song that uh, talked about oh I can't think of the lyrics but it was a John Michael Talbot song who's a Catholic monk and it was something about um, you know having eternal life and and this one church member who didn't like me very much uh, she she blasted me for. Uh, singing that song, saying that, you know, I was teaching that we have an immortal soul. And of course, the song was actually just quoting the Bible. I'm trying to remember exactly what the quote is. Yeah, something about you shall live forever. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that lives in me will never die, uh, I think. And, and it's basically just quoting Christ, right? But because it was a Catholic monk who wrote the song, uh, she thought it was error. Now, is it true uh, that if I accept Christ that I'm going to live forever and never die? Yeah, it is true. Well, I could die tomorrow, or I could even die today. So obviously we mean this in a certain way. Like, for instance, when we get baptized, uh, we teach that we have... It's, it's a symbol of dying in Christ, and then we come up out of the water, and it's a symbol of a new life in Christ. It's how you take it literally or spiritually. It's spiritually is what it's talking about. Okay, right. So, so when we talk about, you know, what Christ 
has done. Like, for instance, A.T. Jones talks, it's, I'm trying to remember which verse it is. It's, I think it's in Ephesians chapter 2, where he says, um, where he talks about what Paul says here. I'll just look it up quickly. Um, yeah, you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And A.T. Jones talks a lot about this. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And we, we had read this when we read some A.T. Jones general conference bulletins. Um, but it's verse five. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, are we right now up in heaven, literally? No, we, would we are. We're not, right? Now, in Christ Jesus, Christ is in heaven, and he's representing something there for us, um, that in Christ, we are in heaven. We are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But we, we're not going to literally uh, believe that, Right? I mean, there might be some people with unbalanced minds who might believe that they're actually not here on earth. They're actually in heaven right now with Christ because it says it in the Bible. And um, so, you know, they're not going to care for their body. They're not going to eat. They're not going to wash or anything like that because they think they're in heaven. And there are people like that who who take something that is is spiritual. It's to be understood spiritually. And they try to apply it literally in the here and now. And we understand that this is a promise that in Christ we will be with him in heaven at some point in the future. We also believe that at some point in the future that there will be no more record of the sins that we have committed. We don't believe that the sins are literally blotted out at the moment we ask God to forgive us. Or that he even literally blotted out all sins when he nailed them to the cross. I mean, I wasn't even born yet. Were my sins nailed to the cross when Christ died on the cross? We can say yes, right? but we can't say that literally they were. So it, it's 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 easy to understand that when we talk about our sins being blotted out, that it doesn't negate the idea that there does come a time when in actuality, we have no more remembrance of those sins any longer. Right? That this is going to happen in the future. Right now, we can remember our, our sins, but there will come a time when we can't. Because they will be literally have been blotted out. So this idea that he's forgiven us our sins, he's forgiven us our sins. We can even say he's blotted out the written record of our sins in Christ. In Christ, that is true. In Christ, I can live in heavenly places. But I have to recognize that there comes a time in history in which those things become reality. Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, as Wagner points out. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a time in which Jesus comes and dies on the cross to fulfill his word. He has to at some point come and die. We don't say, well, he died at the foundation of the world. And so what's the point of Christ coming to die, you know, in 31 AD? If he always, if he's already the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, um, you know, and, and maybe if Wagner was living before the cross, you know, he could say, you know, well, which wouldn't make much sense. But, you know, if he's going to use the same type of reasoning, somebody before the cross could say, well, Christ is already the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And this person who's, who dies on the cross you know, in the future, that can't be the real Messiah because, you know, he's already died on the cross. He's already died for us. So you understand the problem that Wagner has dug himself, this hole that he's dug himself into with this type of reasoning. You know, hopefully that's understood. So when we when we understand that this blotting out of our sins. Hey, though, so, can I ask you a question? Okay. You, um in that verse, it says, handwritings or uh, handwritings for or, ordinance. So it, it says, yeah, the blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Okay. And well, I showed you some other translations. 
And where, some of these translations uh, give things like, I don't know, where is it here? Uh, I was just wanting to know what ordinance were. If, what is well, ordinance? ordinance is like a decree. Uh, you know, that's what, what it, it's kind of like, that's why they have canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Right. Okay. So we think of an ordinance as a law that is, it's referring to the law. But, you know, when you break the law, they they write that law, they you know, they give you whatever charges and they'll have here is the law you broke right here is, you know, it's whatever, however they number these laws and they'll say this is the law you broke. And so there's a record of the fact that you've bro- broken the law. OK, right. All right. But, so that's what it is. So it's it's the writing of the record of your sin. That is what is being talked about. It's not saying that the law is taken out of the way. He doesn't set aside the law, nailing it to his cross. He sets aside the record of your transgression of the law. Our sins are nailed to the cross. Right? In that sense, when a sin is listed, whatever that sin is, it's one of the sins in God's law. So, you know, we could say it's it's an ordinance if, if we wanted to say it that way. But it's not the law itself that is taken out of the way. It's the sin that we have made by transgressing God's law that's taken out of the way. OK, so that makes sense to people. It does. I just okay. want to clarify. Yeah, good. Good. So anyway, getting back to Wagner's argument. So the idea that um, I don't need to worry about this record of my sins. Well, that's true. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, my sins are blotted out, right? Christ has forgiven me. I don't need to be worrying about the sins hanging over my head. I can go to him anytime, and he's always going to forgive me. He's he's merciful. The only problem is that at some point, if I continue in a course of sin and rebellion against God, I may never go to him for salvation. But God is always willing to forgive. He's not holding anything against us. But we can understand that that as a symbol, the idea of a record of our sins is completely valid. And so we know that we're not we're not saved because there's this book and, and you know, our, you know something gets crossed out, our sins gets crossed out of this book. And we're not lost just because there's a book that has our name crossed out. We're saved by Christ. We have these illustrations that are given in the Bible to help us understand what, what this means. Now, when it comes to the blotting out here, so I'm, 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 I'm going to skip this part here, this um He's just talking about this is all ceremonialism. And, and I kind of think it's a poor argument. So I'm just going to leave that out. Uh, now he's going to talk about uh, what do I mean by this? I have reference to the teaching that no man, how humbly and contritely a man may confess his sins to God, how heartily he accepts Christ as a sacrifice and savior. His sins are only provisionally forgiven, but they are held against him to see how he will hold out. What is this to, but to make him a ticket of leave man? A ticket of, that would be on, on sort of on probation, uh, where you're let out from a prison, but you don't have any conditions. Um, I'm not really sure. You know, it's just an old phrase. It is at best a suspended sentence. You don't forgive your children that way. No real man forgives an offender in such a way, but wholeheartedly letting the evil of the past be as though it had been. Why should why should Christians charge God with doing that which in them would be unchristian? Why not be content with the teaching that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that as far as the East is from the West, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So this addresses what we just talked about. So we know that God is not keeping a record of our sins to hold it over our head. He is not just provisionally forgiving us saying, well, you know, I'm going to forgive you, but you know, if you, if you, uh, you know, sin again, you know, if you can't hold out, 
And then all those sins are going to come back upon you anyway. So I didn't really forgive you. Now, this kind of problem has always existed in Adventism. And, and I think in, in a lot of people's thinking, um, who are legalists, that is, uh, people who think, and there are people who think, that God is holding their sins over them, right? And so I have run into this idea. And it's just so, I mean, it's, it's so odd that Wagner is presenting this as what Adventism is teaching because of the idea of the sanctuary. So I don't think it's something inherent in the sanctuary doctrine. I don't think it's anything that Ellen White ever taught. Um, I just don't find it as something that's really a part of, of, you know, Adventist official doctrine or anything, but it is something that's in people's minds. People do have these impressions, you know, probably because we're sinners and how we, we live in the world and how we relate to God. We don't really know him. And so we might respond in that way. But God is willing to, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that, you know, he removes our sins far from us, which is not so much just about the record of our sins. It's about the fact that we get a changed heart. God wants to change us. And if we are changed, it doesn't matter that there's a written record of our sins. So I mean, we're going to address here. And he says that this all comes from a superficial reading of Acts 3, verse 19. The whole theory of, of a postponed blotting out of sins seems to be based upon a superficial reading of Acts 3, 19. Now, it says, he says, you know, of course, that the proper reading of the text is found in the revised version. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So seasons of refreshing that so seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I don't agree that that's the um, proper reading. But anyway, there is no intimation that the blotting out of sins is to be delayed indefinitely after the repentance and conversion for such a thing is an impossibility. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. And when we repent and then we have fellowship with the Father and the Son, we are at one with them. Where are the sins after we have been cleansed from them? Where was the leprosy after Christ touched the leper and cleansed from it? Him from it. Now he really likes the idea of sin being a disease. That's where he can sort of hide his his uh, irrational thinking. Where was Peter's mother's wife's mother's fever after Jesus touched her hand and it left her? Um, where did it go and where was it kept stored? And where is the pain after the healing balm has been administered? Where is the hunger after the nourishing food has been eaten? Where is the thirst after the refreshing draft? Where is the man's blindness after his eyes were opened? Where was the man's lameness after his feet and ankle bones received strength and his leap and he and he leaped and walked? Where is the sin after a man becomes a new creature? So hopefully you can see what he's doing here. Now, I mean, obviously we don't know where the illness goes. There's not a I mean, he used before there was a written record of, you know, the doctor and so forth. And there is a record, of course, Christ healing people. It's something that's, you know, historical event. So there is a record of it. But obviously, we can't really uh, believe that sins exist in the way that we illustrate them, right? Can our sins be removed from us as the East is from the West? I mean, literally, sins can't be removed. Sins can't even be nailed to a cross, right? How did the sin get nailed to the cross if, you know, sin is not a thing? So the problem, again, is he's he's not taking into account that we're illustrating something with with language that it can't fully embody. Now, Let's look at um, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. What's that? Oh, I thought it was 219. Oh, it's 319. Acts 319. Okay, I'm just trying to decide where I'm going to start reading. Okay, there's lots here. 
Okay, I, I'm just trying to figure out which stuff is relevant to this point. Okay, let's look at Acts 3.18 first. Okay, he says, but those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. So he's pointing back to the fact that there was prophecies regarding Christ and Christ had to come and fulfill those prophecies. And he says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now, is this talking about Jesus Christ coming the first time or the second time? So when he says, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, is, is this the first coming or the second coming? Okay, verse 21 will tell us, whom the heaven must receive, so Christ is in heaven, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So the restitution of all things, has that happened in the first coming of Christ? So so we know. I say no, it ain't. No, it it hasn't. Yeah, it hasn't, right? No. The restitution of all things. He's saying basically this is a progression. There was a prophecy that Christ would come, and Christ has come and he's suffered. He's fulfilled that. And we need to be repent. We need to repent and be converted that our sins may be blotted out. And he's pointing to, to a time in the future when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, which we understand as the latter rain. Right. And then he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So there is the necessity for Christ to come the first time and for Christ to come the second time. And in order for him to come the second time, there has to be this times of the refreshing. And and that's going to occur in connection with the blotting out of sins. I, I don't think it's a superficial reading of the text. I think it's the correct reading of the text. Now, the the revised version trans, so the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So what it's saying is that in order for uh, the times of refreshing to come, you're, you're, you have to have your sins blotted out, right? That you have to repent, be converted, have your sins blotted out, so that the, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Right? So that's the way they translate it. But it's not necessarily the proper translation. There's nothing wrong with this translation. And lots of translations will still have the same idea that that it's going to occur at the same time or in that period of time, the future. There is a future time that the sins will be blotted out. Now, this says we know that Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, yet he has to come and suffer. We know that God's promises are sure, right, that if I come to Christ and I confess my sins, I can trust that my sins are blotted out. I don't need to wait in the future to think that, well, in the future, maybe my sin, there will be no more record of my sins. I can trust now that my sins can be forgiven, that they can be blotted out. But it doesn't mean that, that there isn't a time when sins are actually blotted out. Now, and when I say actually, I don't mean literally, you know, when we're going to have the close of probation, right? And, and that's what he's talking about, this uh, um, this expression that he uses. What does he call it? Ticket of leave man, right? So that's type of probation, I guess, right? So he, he just says, you know, we can't, we can't have that. That, you know, we're on probation and then once, you know, we hold out long enough, then, uh, uh, you know, we get off probation. And that's now there's there's true that there's a period or an opportunity for the world, for the church, for the Jews. They had a period of probation, but that does not undo the idea that the idea that God can forgive us now. Right. They're not 
they're not mutually exclusive ideas because they're illustrations of something. So we know that when probation closes, you know, God doesn't arbitrarily close probation on anyone. That is, he's going to declare as righteous those that are righteous and those that are wicked as wicked. Now, he's going to blot out the sins of the righteous. Now, why does he do that? Why does he remove from their memory the record of their sins during the, you know, at the close of probation? Why does he do that? I believe it. I believe it would be for, uh, just part of the complete healing and yeah, receiving okay. the immortal body. Right. So it's not like God arbitrarily just decides, okay, now I'm going to blot out their sins so that they can't remember them. There is something that happens to the righteous that they see themselves as unrighteous, even though they have no memory of sins that they committed. They're going to be like Christ was. Now, Christ never had sins, right? But he had no uh, memory of sins because he didn't sin. And yet he still felt as a sinner. Right. And this, he, he could, he, right, he could not see on the other side of the tomb that yeah, much of a sinner. Yeah, but even his whole lifetime, he never, he never saw him. Dying, dying, dying the death of the wicked. Christ died the death of the wicked. Right. But when yeah. he took upon himself human nature, he took upon a nature that felt as every sinner feels. Right? So he felt guilt and condemnation and the curse of sin his whole lifetime. He experienced at the cross God's wrath against sin, the separation from his father. And the 144,000 will experience that same thing. Their sins have been blotted out. They cannot bring them to remembrance, but they can still see in their life no good thing. And from their lips is going to come the same cry that Christ cried upon the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yet in that, they are not going to be despondent into the point where they reject God. They're still going to cling to God. In spite of what they see, in spite of what they feel, they have learned to throw themselves upon the mercy of God. And it's going to appear to them, just like it appeared to Christ when Satan came to him in the first temptation, where, you know, Ellen White says it's insinuated that um, that Christ is actually needing to prove that he is Christ because he could be the fallen angel. Uh, you know, he could be Satan himself, you know, that he's maybe self-deceived and Satan is trying to get him. You know, he says, I'm an angel from heaven and just come to, you know, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. But Christ doesn't fall for that because he had heard his father's voice 40 days before saying, this is my beloved son and him I am well pleased. So he, he leaned upon his father's word. That's what he trusted in. So the 144,000 are always going to trust in God's word, in his promises. That's what they've learned to do. So they're going to demonstrate that salvation is real. And what Jesus did on the cross is not merely some arbitrary sort of, um, or, you know, it's not, none of it's play acting. All of it is real. You know, when Jesus came and took upon himself human nature, he did indeed take upon himself our nature. And his salvation is effectual. It will he will be able to demonstrate that those who have faith in him can live the same life that he lived because they're going to have to live that eternally. Now, it's true, we will get a glorified body, but without the glorified character, a glorified body will not secure um, sinlessness. How do we know that? How do we know a glorified body cannot guarantee sinlessness? When Adam and Eve were created, were they created with a sinless nature or a sinful nature? We, we have to, yeah, a sinless nature. But, but they sinned, right? Yeah. So, so obviously a sinless nature can't stop you from sinning. You need to have a character that is sinless. Yeah. 
Perfection did not guarantee against the fall, either for Adam and Eve or for Lucifer. Exactly. And so in order for heaven to be eternally secure, he has to have human beings that have developed a Christ-like character. We can't just magically, he can't just magically change us. Because if he, if he could, he could have done that with Adam and Eve. I mean, it, to me, it's just such a simple idea that um, people who are looking for somehow some magical way in order to overcome sin, if that was, if it, if it was that easy, God would have just done that at the beginning. So God is not going to have robots. He's going to have people who have been redeemed, who have been transformed in character, who love righteousness and hate lawlessness. So his argument, Wagner's argument, just doesn't make much sense to me. We know that there is a progression of events that occur that prophetically have to occur. And the idea that we're going to finally have a generation that can demonstrate that all those who died in Christ are that didn't have that opportunity to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, that didn't that God knows their heart. He knows who is secure in heaven and who is not. And that's not going to be by man's appearance, what man sees. So it, it, to me, it's just, it doesn't really make much sense that Wagner thinks like this. Okay, so so he's going to go on here talking about something that uh, Uriah Smith said that he read in the book Thoughts on Daniel. Uh, just the other day, I picked up an old volume of Thoughts on Daniel and read that the work of Christ since 1844 consists in the remission of sins of those who should be found worthy to have them remitted. I pass by the teaching that the remission of sins depends on a man's worthiness. Uh, that is too badly unevangelical to need refreshing out again, but we are taught in the Bible that remission of sins is something that is received by whosoever believeth in Jesus. Now, I don't know exactly what Uriah Smith said, if it's being distorted by Wagner or not, but definitely we know that that's not true. I mean, anyway, it, it's kind of kind of odd. Um, and in Christ, in imparting the Spirit to the apostles, said, "Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted." There's no teaching of a future remission. The remission of sins is a real thing, as the healing of disease. It cannot take place apart from the individual. Now, this is where I want to um, look at a Spirit of Prophecy quote and. I had it set up and then I got rid of it. Okay. This is a statement from the Review and Herald. No, it's Signs of the Times, pardon me. Signs of the Times, February 14th, 1900. Ellen White says, uh, the Jewish tabernacle was a type of the Christian church. It was a wonderful structure made in two parts, the outer and the inner, one open to the ministration of all the priests, the other to the high priest alone, who represented Christ. The church on earth, composed of those who are faithful and loyal to God, is the true tabernacle whereof the Redeemer is the minister. God and not man pitched this tabernacle on a high elevated platform. This tabernacle is Christ's body. And from north, south, east and west, he gathers those who shall help compose it. Okay, through Christ, the true believers are represented as being built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Paul writes, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's second or, or, or Ephesians chapter two. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth 
unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, this is Ellen White. So obviously Ellen White believes in the sanctuary doctrine. She believes that there comes a point in time in which, you know, probation is going to be closed, the sins are going to be blotted out, etc. So in understanding that, she also understands that what happens in heaven also happens on earth. That we can talk about Christ's ministry in heaven. But she says the true tabernacle, whereof the Redeemer is the minister, God and not, um, and, and that is going to be the church, composed of those that are faithful and loyal to God. Right? So when we talk about the tabernacle that the Lord pitched and not man, we often refer to the heavenly sanctuary, correct? The Seventh-day Adventists, we talk about that. There is a heavenly sanctuary that the Lord pitched and not man. It's in heaven. Christ is the high priest. He's in heaven. But when Christ is ministering in heaven, we also understand that he's ministering here on earth. That what's happening in heaven is connected to what's happening on earth. That is, without anything happening on earth, nothing is happening in heaven. Can we can we agree to that? That when we talk about the hour of God's judgment has come, if there was nobody preaching that the hour of God's judgment was come, would it be true that the hour of God's judgment was come? He needs to have a movement in order for that to be true, right? There has to be a message. When we talk about, you know, what Christ I, does. I, I'm sorry, if I understand it right, you, you, What's can, that? You repeat the, can you repeat the question? Okay. Wh- uh, which question? <laughs> the As well, that... so, so the idea... Anyway, the idea that I'm trying to get across is that what happens on earth and what happens in heaven, they have to happen together. It is Christ is ministering in heaven is not just something happening in heaven. It's connected to what he is doing in his people on earth. The reason why the message of why Christ can begin his judgment at the time he does, October 22nd, 1844, is because Events have happened progressively, prophetically, that has prepared the world to receive a message, right? It's going to happen in the United States. Yeah, all eyes are on America. Right. So that, that is what happens. It happens in the United States. But if it doesn't happen, right, that is, if William Miller doesn't preach a message, if nobody's proclaiming the hour of God's judgment has come, Jesus can't actually just go from the holy to the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844. He can't, he can't just do that. There has to be people on earth. What he's doing in heaven has to be connected to what's, what's, what's on earth. And, and, and sometimes, you know, um, critics of Adventism, they will argue about whether, you know, we picked the right date or not. You know, maybe it should have been September 23rd, 1844, you know, should have been the Day of Atonement, and not October 22nd. And some Adventists even argue it should be October 23rd. But even if we had picked the wrong date, so to speak, you know, we got it wrong, it wouldn't change the truthfulness that Christ could at that point begin his work in the most holy place. If there's nobody following him into the most holy place, and there is, but if there was nobody following him, he can't go. You understand what I'm saying? It's dependent upon a message being proclaimed. Now, I believe they got the right time. Um, I believe in Jerusalem, it was October 23rd, and in America, it was October 22nd. And so when Samuel Smith, or not Samuel Smith, uh, Hiram Edson in the cornfield, he sees Christ moving, that would be at the time in Jerusalem that the high priest would have been, if there was a sanctuary, moving from the holy to the most holy. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. But, but the point is that there's this connection between heaven and earth, that none of this is just pretend. There, there is a work that is being done in the proclamation of a message that addresses the judgment of the dead. There comes a point where the judgment moves to the living. And that's because a certain message or truth is being understood. 
That is, there are people that are now being prepared to be the 144,000. And that will go through the time of Jacob's trouble. So I understand that sometimes we have this sort of, well, here's a good example. So when we tell stories to children, you know, Bible stories and so forth, I mean, they can take them quite literally. You know, we will tell them they're Jesus' little lamb, you know, and they don't really know what metaphor means or anything, right? It doesn't, doesn't really mean much to them. And yet, you know, there is seeds of truth there that they can then comprehend as they grow, as they get older. And I think as Christians, some of us have never graduated from uh, primary, right? We still think in these very simplistic terms, and I'm not saying it's we shouldn't be as little children. I think we should be in our trusting of God. But sometimes when we criticize the truth, we're actually criticizing a child's representation of the truth. And we think that we're somehow wise because, you know, obviously Christ couldn't be ministering in the heavenly sanctuary because his blood would be dry by now. You know, he couldn't be sprinkling blood in, the, in heaven. Right. I mean, but that's a ridiculous idea Or Nicodemus saying, you know, how can I be born again? Must I enter into my mother's womb again? You know, obviously he knows that's that's not what Jesus is saying. So I think this is is an important point um, in understanding this truth, particularly the, the the truth of salvation and of the sanctuary. So obviously it's an important doctrine. But people will present these sort of fall, a straw man arguments when they attack it. Yes, somebody, Kelly. I'm I'm thinking of the uh, yeah I'm thinking of the uh, 144,000 the literal things that are going on between heaven and earth and the ceiling of the 144,000. Now we know that when Satan crucified Christ, basically sealed mm -hmm. the settled forever the question in the minds of the angels, the heavenly angels. Is that right? Now what I'm where I'm going with this question is actually is there some sort of seeding process that takes place for the unfallen worlds that are watching too like that they have to be shown that god is making the right decision as well right? well, so well yeah we know that, that they're, they're watching in the universe is that some sort of a seeding sort of settling into the truth of the matter well, i don't know i don't think that's part yeah, of the seeding Okay, but no, no, it's but, not part of this evening, but it is sort of a thing that's going on in heaven. We could call it something, but it's definitely a, a settling into the truth for them, fully accepting the truth of salvation that it is sufficient. That yeah, well, they're, not, definitely, they're definitely watching what what happens on earth, and but yeah, I don't know, I don't know if I would. I'm not, I'm not certain. So it's it, yeah. It's just sanctified imagination. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, the next paragraph here. Um, the object objection is raised that to teach that Christ made atonement for sins on the cross is to teach the doctrine of indulgence, uh, the forgiveness of sins before they are committed. Uh, what? I don't know if I've ever heard anything so ridiculous as an objection. An objection does not... Are you reading something? Or? Yeah, I'm reading Wagner here. He says, the objection is raised, right, that to teach that Christ made atonement for sins on the cross. So that's what Wagner's teaching. Um, he says people object to it, saying that that is to teach the doctrine of indulgence, the forgiveness of sins before they are committed. Mm. I don't know. That, that it's, just, it's just so far out. Some mm. of the things that he brings up, I just could see it. I could see that, you know, how he could get that idea. I could see how he might get that idea and that the atonement covers past, present, future, all sin. Yeah, but, but we don't. Uh, it's not but he's not giving the idea. idea that atonement was, was done at the cross. He thinks, you know, he, he's arguing that atonement, because we say, you know, the atonement is not complete until, you know, the universe and everything right. is all united with Christ. Like there's a process, there's a day of atonement. And he says, well, no, the atonement is just right. at the cross. And that people, 
when he says that, people will say, well, that's like teaching the doctrine of indulgence, the forgiveness of sins before they are committed. But but we all believe that Christ mm. provided the atonement for sins at the cross. Nobody argues that. Now, was the atonement right. completed? Yeah. That means was everything accomplished, completed? And that's that's a much different question, right? But he's not arguing that. It, it, it's such a straw yeah, man. Is it, there, yeah, it really is. It's, it's so incomplete and and like the oh, sorry, Christ died on the cross. When he cried, died on the cross, atonement was supplied. Like the sacri- the the Lord will supply the ram, and He supplied Christ. So provision has been made for forgiveness of sin. Not well, I don't even think it's just it's done. I think Christ actually forgave oh. our sins on the cross. I don't think it's provision at all. Well, we're not forgiven unless we repent. Well, okay. Individually. We don't experience forgiveness, but, you know, um, you know, as a father, I forgive my kids before they sin. I mean, I don't, I don't just have provision for forgiveness. I mean, it depends what you mean, I guess, but, I mean, I have provided love, right? I provided love. It's not conditional. My forgiveness stop. (laughs) My my forgiveness for my kids is not conditional. I forgive my kids whether they accept it or not, right? As a father. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, where where does that fine line? Is he is he saying? I'm sorry. Is is he saying? Is he saying that? If he's saying that God forgives you for sins that you might commit in the future. Is that what he's saying? Of course God's forgiven us for sins that are in the future. No, right. he's just making a straw man argument. He, okay. He's he's misrepresenting what we mean when we say the Day of Atonement. He's saying, well, the Day of Atonement, obviously atonement happened at the cross. You don't need a Day of Atonement, Right. But it happens to be the same word. But there is a time for the Day of Atonement. Doesn't mean that there wasn't atonement at the cross, right? You What's know, the it, difference? What's the difference? Christ says on the cross, "It is done," and then at the uh, final death of the second, it's it is finished. Or is it? It is well, finished. It doesn't it is done? No, no, it doesn't matter. It, what the the, the, the sacrifice the is done? He could have said, "It is finished. It is done." It doesn't matter. They're the same thing. It's not like there's Theater, special. Do you understand what I'm referring to? The other, yes, you understand I know what you're referring to. Yes, I understand what you're referring to. Yes. Please so, remind me. Hey, okay. stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please remind me. Hey, stop. Please remind me what the verse is that I'm referring to. <laughs> uh, the verse itself? Um, well, yeah, he's yeah. going to say. It is done. There's yeah. two different things. It, 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 it is finished, but it's no different. Right? There's no difference in the language. Okay, that's all I'm Tell me. Tell me about it. Mm-hmm. Tell me okay. about it. It's been a long un- misunderstanding among Adventism. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 6. It is done. I, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right? Uh, Revelation 16. Yeah. Seventh angel pours out his vial. And there comes a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Right? Right? Okay? So now we, um, here, I'm just going to go to this here. It just, it doesn't mean anything different. It's the same thing. Yeah, you're saying it's the same word or whatever, but I just want to see that because you're good at that. It doesn't even matter if it's the same word. It's just the, the idea is the same. It's not like there's a difference between something being done and something being finished. Um, but I, I'm just going to check here. Yeah. I mean, there happened to be a different word. Um, and exactly. actually, the and if you look at it, oh, yes. yeah. but, but the one, yeah, the one in John 19, verse 30, where he says, mm-hmm. it is finished and bowed his head and gave up the ghost, that word, is the word that means it's absolutely completed. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so the atonement is complete. Right? Now, the other one, if you go to uh, Revelation, uh, chapter 16, verse 17, and 
Revelation 21, verse 6. They both have an expression, it is done. This one um, means it is come into being. So it's it's actually even, I mean, if you're going to put anything that's being completed, that would be it is finished. It is done means that everything has been performed. So so it's a little bit yeah. different. Yeah, the, the, the thing that, yeah, the thing that the, the subtle differences there were uh, being, uh, you know, uh, used in papers in the 80s, I remember this, about a, a, the atonement uh, discussions, right? Do you remember this? Yes, and yes. That's you what I'm getting at. Right, and, but what, what I'm saying is I'm just that trying, you trying to get some clarity on that issue. What I'm saying is you can't take these words and give them any significance in that argument is what I'm trying to say. Well, that's what you're saying. I'm just saying that there was a lot of significance given to them. And I, I just forget half of the arguments that went on back there, but I, I never did settle on that. So that's all. Well, well, actually, if you're going to look at the one on the cross where he says it is finished, I mean, that means it's complete. It's come to an end, right? And so we say, well, atonement wasn't completed at the cross. That's the expression people use. But actually, the very word he used means complete. It's come to an end. So, so he's saying, he's saying, we can, what's that? Go ahead, Will. He's saying that, Go ahead, Will. We, he's saying that Christ, is he trying to make the argument that Christ did not make an atonement for sin on the cross? No, no. He's not trying to make that argument. Who, who, who's trying to make that argument? The, um, Wagner. No, he's trying to say atonement was done on the cross and that we don't need a day of atonement. But I agree that atonement was done on the cross. Well, I do too, but I'm trying to figure out what is he trying to say? He's trying to say that if you have a day of atonement, that you you believe that atonement didn't happen at the cross. It's a straw man argument that is he's he's, okay. he's misrepresenting what what we understand. This this was happening in the 80s. And so people got in caught up in this this dialectical debate over, you know, was atonement completed at the cross or is it, you know, obviously the sacrifice for the atonement was completed at the cross. But we're not in heaven right now. The world hasn't come to an end. They're still wicked. So obviously, there's something that has to be complete. And if you're saying it's at one minute, that is not complete. The final work of what Christ accomplished at the cross has not been, has not come to complete fruition. That is um, the one in Revelation where it says it is done. The idea is that it has been performed, right? So this has to do with the idea that um, the work of atonement in all of its aspects is is going to come to an end, right? But the atonement was completed at the cross. And so when people try to argue this, this language, right, that's the problem with language, you have to understand the concepts that are there. You can't just argue words. And, and that's what Wagner's doing, is he's, he's taking that word atonement and saying, well, the atonement for sins was at the cross, so why do we need a day of atonement? Right? So he doesn't believe in the sanctuary message because we don't need a day of atonement. But he's just ignoring that he's actually arguing against himself. Because if, if that was true then why do we even need the cross? Why do we need any time at all? So, you know, I, I, I find it, I don't like when people use this type of reasoning because it, it's not honest. It's not open. And it's so unlike how he wrote before, right? How he reasoned prior to his apostasy. He used to be able to reason reasonably but now he can't. Says that we might as well stop here, although the temptation is strong to go on with many other lines branching out of this. All that I wanted was to let you know where I stand and the reason for it. I couldn't stand otherwise and believe the gospel, yet I know that you believe the gospel and at the same time 
hold nominally at least to the denominational teaching on the sanctuary. I know that you are very busy, but I wish for the sake of old times that you would point out to me where I am wrong. Well, I wish I could, but I can't. How could I honestly hold my place as a preacher and teacher in the denomination so long as I did if I feel that my views would keep me out of the denominational ministry now? For one thing, my views were not so sharply defined as they are now um, since they were a gradual growth. Moreover, the lines are drawn much more closely now than when they, they were then. You know that men have been retired from the ministry for differing on so uncertain a matter as the interpretation of Daniel 11. What then would be the fate of a man in the ministry who should announce his descent from the denominational teaching on the sanctuary question, which is considered to be the keystone of the whole ark? Besides, I was never a belligerent, and as I always held and do still, what deemed to be the really essential truths of the message, I contented myself with teaching them and holding my peace concerning things that I knew were not biblical. Of course, I was often accused of not preaching the message, but things would be tolerated in one already long in the work, and that would not be in one just entering in or re-entering it after long absence. You know that in spite of my non-militant attitude, I was in hot water a good deal of the time. Still further, I was possessed of the spirit of Whittier's lines, which at the time I did not know. A bending reed I would not break, a feeble faith I would not shake, not eat, nor even rashly pluck away the error which some truth may stay, whose loss might leave the soul without a shield against the shafts of doubt. I have seen so many ill-balanced persons throw away all truth, even the Bible itself, simply because they suddenly, perhaps rudely, were awakened to the consciousness that there was chaff mingled with the wheat that they had received. I've always believed that the best way to uproot error is to sow very thickly the seeds of truth. For that reason, I've never undertaken and have never and, and never shall undertake any propaganda against the denomination. This letter is only a private expression of my views on one line, and I have no intention whatever of making it public, although I do hope to be given the time and opportunity to publish the clear, simple truths of the atonement without calling special attention to any denomination. Um, then he's going to go just talk about the Sabbath, and that it's important, and that's basically the end of it. Okay, so we now understand what happened to Wagner. Now, it could be, you know, that Wagner simply, you know, never understood Adventism, but I don't think that's the case. I think that he rejected the truth because the reason that all people do is that it cuts against something in them. And we have to be really careful. So just because we believe the truth doesn't mean that we're secure secure from deception and self-deception. We have to be aware of, of why we take, why we believe what we believe. We know lots of things we believe are incomplete. Some things are wrong. And so Wagner is presenting some truths here, but he's using these truths as a way of avoiding other truths. And that's, and people do this all the time. And so we've seen in this movement where people will stand by the truth, they'll, there'll be something that they think is important, which is true. It's a true thing. It's important. And then they represent other people as not believing that because they believe something else. And so they misrepresent what that person believes as somehow going against another truth. I know I didn't really say that the best way, but, but you understand what I mean, that there are, there are things that that people believe that are true. And if they want to attack you, they can say you don't believe something because you believe something else that must contradict that. That if you believe this thing, then it means you don't believe this other thing, that they're not compatible. Right. And that's not really fair. We know that the truth is, is very deep. It's not something that can just be, a shallowly address. And as each individual, we studied God's word to know the truth. We want to be converted by the truth. We want that light to shine into our hearts and show us our need of Christ. And there's no way that I could reject the sanctuary message, especially based on these types of 
of childish arguments that Wagner's used. He's not really addressing the issues. So we need to finish. Any final thoughts? I know Kelly posted some statements there, but I don't want to address all of them. People can copy them and read them later if they want. Okay, well, let's pray. But dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath and for the things that we have studied. We give our hearts to you. We ask that you can use us and that you can correct us when we are in error. We know there's many things we do not understand, but we know, Lord, that um, that you have given us light and that this light is precious, and that we need to obey that light. Be with each person. Bless them. Bless the meetings tomorrow. And help us to continue to follow and serve you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.